Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Explore at Home, the Great Exhibition Road Festival's online series of events where we bring you the best of art and science, nature and technology, innovation and cultural heritage from across South Kensington directly into your homes. My name is Neil Jennings. I'm the Partnership Development Manager for the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment, and I'll be your host for today's discussion. In the next hour, I'm delighted to say we'll be joined by three amazing speakers who'll be telling us all about their new green interventions on Exhibition Road, and we'll be discussing the built environment and the role of architects and urban designers in the sustainability agenda and connecting the public with the natural world. But before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to remind everyone that today is an interactive discussion and we'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and questions throughout. So just write to us on the YouTube chat function and your comments will be passed on to me to put to our speakers. Um, just as a reminder as well to please be considerate when posting in the chat and we will be removing anything that disrupts the experience for others. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Matt Chilton is an associate designer at architecture and design studio Mitzi Studio and leads the Home Away From Hive uh, installation at the Science Museum. Shay Adelikun is an artist, architectural designer and creative practitioner whose practice focuses on promoting environmental stewardship and regenerative circular economies through sustainable community design spaces. And Shay will be talking to us about her algae meadow installation. And Nasios Fanavas is an architect, academic and co-founder of Urban Radicals, a London-based studio centered around materially conscious, human-centered design. This year, Urban Radicals was selected to curate and design the Cypress Pavilion for the Venice Architecture Biennial. And Nasios will be talking to us about his installation, Windflower. So by way of a bit more context for the event today, the three speakers represent the three green interventions constructed along the exhibition road, who were the winning entries in the South Kensington Outdoor Trail Design Competition. Each intervention was developed in partnership with one of the three cultural partner institutions. So those were the Victorian Albert Museum, the Science Museum and the Goethe Institute. And the aim of the installations is to create habitats to support biodiversity, to welcome wildlife back to South Kensington at the same time as we're welcoming people back as well. And the South Kensington Outdoor Trail project is being delivered by Discover South Kensington in partnership with the London Festival of Architecture and is supported by the Royal Commission for the Exhibition of 1851 and Kensington and Chelsea Council. So with uh, the, those introductions out of the way, we'll now hear a bit more of each of the green interventions from each of the speakers in turn. So we'll start with Matt, then Shay, then Nasios. So Matt, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, thank you, Neil. So, um, Home Away From Hive, uh, it really all started with what was a dream brief. How do you embed biodiversity back into the public realm and build sustainably? We knew we wanted to talk about pollinators. Um, we were really inspired by the RBKC's B superhighway. Um, we also wanted to use scale to create something um, immersive and engaging um, that also brought people down to the size of a pollinator to hopefully foster empathy that way. Um, so we conceived of this wild bee's nest, uh, termite mound morphic structure of planters that we planted pollinator friendly plants. Um, in the UK, uh, we've lost, I think it's 97% of our wildflower meadows since the 1930s. And um, with that, many of our pollinators, pollinators that are so important to our um, ecosystems and even our own food supply, uh, one in every three mouthfuls that we eat is thanks to our pollinators. So we knew that if we were going to build at scale um, within the budget and more importantly, sustainably, we were going to really have to cleverly combine um, structural rigidity, aesthetics and uh, functionality all in one stripped back build system. So we ended up with this uh, lattice of sustainably sourced spruce ply, it's a tongue twister. Um, each piece is nested and cut from sheet material um, to minimize wastage and then half lapped kind of puzzled together to um, minimize extra structure and um, fixings. So in terms of structural rigidity, that's inherent within our lattice. We actually managed to use 99% um, ply in the build, which was amazing. Um, in terms of aesthetics, that ribbed honeycomb-like texture 
that we got from the uh, lattice uh, was really reminiscent of wild bees' nests. And in terms of functionality, the, the lattice also allowed us to have these integrated planters, which was um, great. Uh, so in the end of the day, we really wanted to create a space in which people and pollinators could coexist in harmony and learn about each other, essentially. Um, it's very much in line with what we do as a studio. We are inspired by nature, powered by technology. Uh, many of our projects exist to bridge the gap between the built and natural environment, whether that be through uh, biomorphic design, biophilic, uh, biomimicry, handcraft, vernaculars. So um, yeah, we really relish the opportunity to be working in our uh, city's cultural epicenter on Exhibition Road and um, with one of our, one, an amazing institution like the Science Museum. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of it for me. Uh, I think a video now is going to come up that shows you a bit more about the build. Um, if you like it, please go to our Instagram. You'll see some more there. So uh, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Shea Delican, and I'm going to be presenting Algae Meadow, the project that I collaborated with Wayward on for the Exhibition Road uh, project. So um, myself and Wayward came together um, to collaborate on this project. Um, myself, uh, coming from a back architectural background, um, my work as um, Neil originally already um, said, looks at promoting environmental stewardship and regenerative circular economies. Um, and um, as well, I also work as at Assemble as an architectural designer and an uh, advocate for the Black Females in Architecture Network. Um, previously, the work I've done has um, formed of bamboo uh, structures, natural building techniques such as cob building, um, and also um, looking at recycling plastic through the Plastic Pavilion, which um, looks at um, a creative and um, stimulating design that enforces people to think about their material world in a new um, perspective. Um, and then we have Wayward, um, and Wayward is a London-based landscape art and architecture practice. Um, and they have been running since 2000, and 16, I believe. Um, and they, i um, just gonna go to the next slide so that we get to Wayward's slides quickly. Um, and they have been working through looking at transforming derelict sites and large scale um, design driven spaces and engaging the local community um, through looking at plants and how we can connect to our nature, natural environments through design. This includes um, medicinal plants, pop-up gardens and so forth. Um, so algae meadow. Algae meadow basically looks at a wildflower vertical meadow that connects the architecture of Exhibition Road to the depths of the Serpentine Lake in High Park. Um, looking at hydro, uh, hydroponic canopy um, to connect uh, the ecosystems between land and water. I'm just going to stay on this slide for one second. Um, and um, so it was looking at creating a productive algae factory of plant workers that will explore um, how basically the different biodiversities in our local environment can work together. Um, so just a little bit about algae. Algae is basically an aquatic organism that basically lives in water and it uses photosynthesis to basically grow and regenerate. Um, so the installation, the whole idea was to be a kit of parts um, forming so that it could be one sustainable in its construction method and also its lifespan after the installation. Um, and we wanted to work collaboratively with, um, and we did work collaboratively with scientists from UCL and um, Imperial 
um, college to look at how we would harvest algae and grow it, um, looking at the different um, algae in the Serpentine Lake. Next slide. Um, so the first part I'm going to talk to you about is algae paint. There's a series of different parts of the, um, the um, project. Algae paint, We I looked at exploring different um, ways to create this through different tests, um, whereas work, working with more water, more oil to find, finally find out the final application of the paint. Um, and you can see it on its final application. Next slide. Um, and then the community build aspect. aspect. The on-site build was um, involved um, students from London-based universities such as UCL and um, people from um, Black Females and Architecture Network. And the build and the design of the project meant that it could be very like flat pack and easily constructible. And it was used as a construction and training um, experience for young architects and designers who really need to gain that experience um, in, all, in the professional world to enhance their career and their knowledge. Now the hydroponic meadow um, is a, basically hydroponics, if you don't know, it's basically science of growing plants without soil. And it basically feeds through material, mineral nutrients in the water. So using the algae that we were harvesting above in the canopy, um, we are siphoning some of that and putting it into the hydroponic system, um, allowing it to basically fertilize the plants. So it's really understanding how these algae, the aquatic organisms and these land organisms can work together. As you can see here, we're using meadow turf, um, using recycled plastic sheets called storm ball to create the trays and plastic bottles um, to have um, clay um, pebbles and perlite that the roots would basically filter through and use capillary action to suck the water up. Um, so in there, we had a list of different kind of um, meadow flowers such as hemp, wild strawberries and so forth. And then finally, we have the algae canopy. The algae canopy um, is this beautiful and um, green growing uh, canopy that um, will basically slowly get greener and greener as time develops. Um, it has corella, which is also used by people for drinks and smoothies, which is not only nutritious for plants, but also people. So we wanted to show the different characteristics and benefits of algae. Um, and as it grows, it will continue growing with the sunlight and um, also with a pump that people can interact with and pump oxygen into the tube so that it can grow and flourish. Um, we hope that through this installation, people can understand the complexities of our local environments and local materials and see and be inspired to work with it and learn more about it and design with it and work with it um, in all forms of life. Um, I hope you enjoy the algae meadow. Hello, my name is uh, Nasius Vernavas. I'm the director of Urban Radicals and I'm gonna talk about the wildflower. And if we can see the slides, thank you. Um, so the Windflower is an installation uh, we designed in collaboration with uh, Adam Harris, who's a landscape uh, architect and designer. He's a really good friend of ours. And um, the, the idea stemmed of, uh, through these conversations we had with Adam and the research that we've done, and we looked into the wind energy um, farms in the UK. And um, with uh, COP26 in mind and all the green initiatives for 2050, we're looking into this, um, the wind farms themselves and uh, how they, they are spaces and places of production. Um, but projecting forward in 15, 20 years, um, the, the materials that are being used in the wind turbines themselves are very difficult to recycle. So uh, we try to integrate uh, notions of Creative, up, creative upcycling, and um, we came up with this idea of reusing a uh, decommissioned uh, wind turbine blade, which we uh, um, got hold of from uh, Catapult, our collaborators. Uh, this is a slide which uh, shows um, the, the afterlife of, of these giant megastructures. And so we are hoping to raise awareness, but also to, to, to give a small uh, way uh, for, for the use of these um, big in infrastructures and integrate them back into our city. And the last slide that uh, I want to explain, uh, it just shows the, the, the process, uh, quite straightforward. We 
the wind turbine on the left, uh, the wind turbine blade, which is what we uh, got uh, from our uh, partners. And uh, basically we used that wind turbine blade, we sliced it and uh, modified it and basically grafted uh, native uh, wildflower uh, plants into a structure. Uh, some more photographs just to show the process of making, which was uh, extremely um, challenging, but uh, it, it would never happen with uh, these people and uh, without uh, the larger team. So this is uh, the blade that we used. This is uh, 15, 16 years old. Uh, it was sitting there uh, in the testing ground um, and we, we kind of changed the way <laughs> the way it looks and its, its, its function. And we finally managed to get it to our fabricator to be chopped and uh, worked uh, upon. Uh, and then we, we can see the next slides just to see more of the process of making. Uh, obviously, um, things that we haven't done before. Uh, we worked with design and making our fabricators who were amazing in kind of helping us to achieve this in a, in a very short time. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the place uh, just sitting outside the workshops after they've been, uh, they've been cut into planters and seating. Next slide. And this is the installation uh, on Exhibition Road. Uh, quite challenging to get these uh, big pieces in place, um, but uh, it, it really came together. Uh, next slide. And the, the planters going in, the native wildflowers, uh, and, and some of the process of, of making, which we really um, enjoyed and, and we want to celebrate it uh, rather than just showing our, our final piece of work. Next slide. Uh, us all working together. Um, from the fabricators to friends like Mark Thomas, who came to help us for the day. Um, and next slide. And uh, as soon as we kind of cleaned up the, the side, of people uh, came in and they were trying to understand what this, uh, <laughs> this thing is. And next slide. Uh, during the night for the, if you live around there, it'd be nice, I think, to just uh, walk around and uh, see how the structure also changes. And we've installed this um, solar power powered um, spotlights that light up and they kind of bring a, a different kind of texture and, and uh, an atmosphere to, to the project itself. Next slide. And just a couple of more photos uh, of people uh, wondering what these uh, things are. Next slide. Um, yeah, and I, I really want to thank uh, everyone that was involved. Uh, obviously, Jack Shivers from Design and Making was our fabricator, or Catapult, who uh, we got the blade from, Atelier One, who did the structural engineering, Mark Thomas, who came to help us with the installation, and Aerotrope, uh, Chris Jones, that helped us uh, reach out to, to Or Catapult. And um, a big thanks to Emily, who organized this from Discover South Kent and the people of Get and, and the LFA. Thanks a lot. Great, many thanks, Nasios, uh, Shay and Matt. Uh, really great to see and hear more about, um, I guess, the motivation for installations and, and how they actually came into being. I had, was on campus yesterday, I had the chance to have a walk around. It was great to see members of the public interacting and, and reading all the information about the kind of motivation for them and the companies, the different installations, that's, that's excellent. So we'll move into a kind of a Q&A now. So please do post your questions in the chat and we'll, and we'll put them to uh, the panelists. But um, I'd like to start off with a, a question of my own, um, which is kind of about how these, I mean, you, you touched on it in some of your, your kind of presentations, just to, for you to maybe elaborate more about how these um, the installations came into being in terms of the kind of bridging of the gap between art and culture and science. So um, I go through from Matt, Shea, and then Nasios. If you could like to just just kind of elaborate a bit more about the process that you went through of developing the pieces, including um, uh, how you went about engaging with scientists. So I've um, Yes, thanks, Neil. Um, so I I really do believe that the combination of um, of science, culture, and uh, nature will save the planet. Um, science has allowed us to kind of 
monitor our planet. It's uh, taught us that our way of life, the Anthropocene, is unsustainable, and it will play a vital role in in turning that around. Um, culture will play a vital role in social engagement. Um, it's uh, and learning. I mean, in terms of learning, we must learn from pre-Anthropocene and native cultures. Many of us must become native again to our locales. We must re understand the um, the nuances of our local land, our local nature, our local materials. And um, it's going to be a culture shift based on that fusion of science, technology and um, nature that will pull us through. And in order for there to be a culture shift, um, we really need to engage people, uh, meaningfully engage people. So throughout our development process, um, the most important questions were always, uh, will people find this beautiful? Will people find this exciting? Will they be excited? You know, will they read the things that we have to say? Will they take memories home with them? Um, yeah, we think this is, for this kind of project is the most important thing. Um, in terms of working with scientists, uh, we had Kew Gardens consulting on this project. Uh, we've also been working with Kew on a children's restaurant in Kew Gardens, which will be open soon. And this is all about teaching children about the power of plants, where their food comes from, diversity, growing, all these super important things. And um, yeah, working with the scientists is just a dream, really. Like um, having, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good combination, really, because uh, we just enjoy learning from them. And they love to see, you know, all this theoretical stuff come to life in any way possible. So, um, so yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Matt. I really like the uh, the way you describe that there about you know providing something that people are excited by. I think that's absolutely essential. I mean, you know, given the the speed of of change that's required to tackle both the climate and ecological emergency, it's absolutely essential that we're putting forward kind of positive visions of the future that that people are genuinely genuinely excited by and want to be want to be part of. And I think these kind of uh, installations are a really important important part of that. Great. So thanks. So, so Shane, your uh, introduction. You mentioned work, working with both UCO and Imperial um, in your um, in your installation. So perhaps you could just elaborate a bit more about how that process came about and and how you found it. Yeah, sure. So um, we were working uh, with Brenda and Annette from UCL, who were developing and helping us harvest the Corella algae, um, which is one of the algae in um, the algae canopy. The other mixture is a more complex algae um, ecology from the Serpentine Lake. And then we'll and that was um, harvested and um, working with Patrick, Marine, and George from Imperial. Um, and it was really informative um, experience and a chance for us to learn as architects and designers, and also understand that we were making an installation that had a lifespan and was living and evolving. Um, and I think it's really important to remind us whether or not we're working with nature in our building of built environments or not, that you know the things we create have a lifespan and have an afterlife and thinking about what happens after we finish designing. Um, so it really taught us um, about the different processes of um, working with algae, the complexity of it, and it really informed how we were going to, you know, work, put it, um, incorporate it into our installation. So one of the interesting facts um, about algae is that you can get algae blooms and algae blooms are, is when algae grows really rapidly and it actually is actually harmful for plants. So that was a really important part that we had to look at to make sure that, you know, the algae canopy, we have to kind of kind of control how much algae is going into the hydroponic system so that it can be in a very, you know, like balance um, ec um, ecology. Um, obviously nature is a very complex and as you learn about this it's important to really understand the complexity and work with that and I think it's just a great learning process and then to work with you know the culture institutions such as the VNA and Manisha on that team and looking at how we can use that to like create a narrative that we, the general public can understand what's going on and find a new interest in um, their local environment is just like a one interdisciplinary team so thanks Jay and oh, interesting to, to was this the first time you'd worked with algae and interesting to hear whether this whether you have any future yeah. plans already or future intentions to work with it in in, in your in your future work 
Yeah, it's the first time I've ever worked with algae. Um, I've had a real interest with, with it. I have a real interest in moss and algae and water in general with aquatic organisms. So it was a great, like, fantastic opportunity. You know, it was a proposed idea with a hope that it could materialise and working with scientists realise it was um uh, possible and also to understand like not only the aesthetic importance of like exciting the public but the functional purpose of it definitely and I hope later on um, definitely want to explore different other algae and bio materials in architectural development and design and how that can be more accessible to the public and how people can have like engage in the process of making is a really big part of um, the work in my practice. Right, I guess it has That's great cool. stories as well um, about nutrification as well you can tell stories around about you know those kind of issues as well so i, I think it's brilliant well yeah. done. <laughs> thanks Brilliant. thanks matt and thanks shay and so we have a question that's coming from from sarah so sarah asks and perhaps uh, nasios you can kind of build on that conversation and and maybe uh, respond to sarah's question here as well so she asks how difficult was it to collaborate using the knowledge from scientists to bring your ideas uh, for the structures to life so were there any particular challenges in in that respect um, you know, what, what are the kind of challenges and barriers that you came across as you were developing your work? And then and then Matt and Shay, if you'd like to kind of elaborate on uh, in response to Sarah's question, please feel free to do so after Nasios has responded. Um, we collaborated with our catapults, who are an organization who does uh, testing for the lakes uh, up, up north. Um, it was it, it was really challenging because uh, they had live projects uh, and, and they work on site, so uh, and, and the structures themselves are uh, of huge scale. Uh, the materials uh, we didn't know uh, how they behave in a, in a different way. Um, but I, I think the research itself and uh, understanding the numbers and the amount of uh, waste that might uh, be resulted out of this process has really helped us to shape uh, our question. And I think. Um, if the engineer or science uh, is about uh, resolving a problem, then I think uh, the role of us designers is to, to pose the right question. And, and in our case, uh, we, we really try to raise awareness about, about this, uh, not seeing it as a problem as such, but to turn it into a, a kind of positive. Um, I, I think the the collaboration is still ongoing and the conversation with them is still ongoing and we would really like to see uh, how the, the creative reuse of, of these materials uh, can take shape in, in bigger scales. Yeah, thanks, Nasios. I think, I mean, so one thing is when you're talking about the kind of repurposing and, and reusing of, 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 of wind turbine blades and with such a kind of a beautiful installation you've got, the kind of example I often think of is is around these, you know, the, the, the growth we have now in uh, electric vehicle batteries. And so in a number of years time, we need to be thinking about, you know, what, what, what happens with them in terms of the way in which they recycle and stuff like that. And I think they're kind of maybe not so much in the kind of in the art and design side of stuff, but I think they're kind of quite exciting opportunities about the second life applications of, of those, those kind of technologies, these batteries that are in people's cars at the moment and the way they can be used potentially in people's homes in kind of terms of energy storage and stuff as well. So I think like the way you described it in terms of these being challenges in terms of what we do with these things when they come to the end of their, you know, their first life, if you like, and thinking then about their, their second and third lives, if you like, afterwards, I think is really, really key. Um, so Matt, if I go over to you now, if you'd like to kind of respond to, to Sarah's question, then Shay, if you'd like to follow on. Oh, sorry, Matt, I think you're on mute. Hello. Um, I don't see any problems. I mean, the only problem is maybe getting in front of these people uh, in the first place. Um, that's obviously kind of really important. Um, but I think because these people are just kind of a real barrage of knowledge at some times and um, every tiny little thing is as important as the larger things. And for, for us in these types of projects, I see us more of a kind of a conduit really, like we're that pretty Apple plug that makes that information more accessible and engaging for people. Um, and in other ways, we're, we're kind of the middleman between making these messages and science um, into, into culture and infrastructure. Um, but yeah, it's really enjoyable. Great, and Shay? Uh, yeah, following on from what Matt said, I think um, the challenge which arises when we are so specialised in our um, fields is that uh, there's a lack of maybe 
cross communication across fields. I think having these opportunities where we can work on projects and create new languages, which you know tran translate over different disciplines, means that we can start um, de um, developing projects that are more coherent and work together in a more efficient way. Um, I think the, that might be kind of I'm kind of answering the solution to maybe the problem, which is the lack of, you know, interdisciplinary work, maybe. Um, I think what's really interesting, what I learned from working with the scientists is just understanding the complex, like the complexity of the, like the organism. And I think artwork and installation work as well usually happens in quite quick turnarounds and the kind of um, time frame of different works are very different. So, you know, scientists can work on something for years and research, and then we're coming in doing quite short, um, um, fast paced work. And it's also trying to understand how we can make, make something authentic and true and not maybe like greenwashing something and making sure we really use that data and information and like present it to the public um, in a like, you know, responsible way. Um, I think that's was the biggest challenge um, that we faced whilst working on the Algae Meadow project for sure. Great, thanks Jay. And yeah, making that that space and time for those kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations uh, can, can yeah. certainly be a challenge, but I think as all of your installations kind of illustrate, they can be incredibly rewarding as well and hopefully can lead to things, other collaborations and, 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 and things which would not have been considered, uh, you know, had you not brought together that those different kind of range of perspectives. Okay, so we'll go on to another question now. So I'm noticing particularly, Shay, with your, your background being very, very green. Uh, <laughs> so um, I guess over the last 18 months, I think we've probably all started to appreciate the kind of nature and connection to nature and access to nature a lot more than we maybe maybe did before. We took, maybe took it for granted. So, um, and I know that obviously all the installations have that as a key key part of their kind of, of their design and their, their, their function, if you like. So um, just maybe if you could, could, could just kind of elaborate about why you think bringing nature back into our urban environments is so important? Um, wow, yeah, it's a, it's a very important question. Um, nature has a mental, emotional, spiritual um, effect on us and we are nature. That's the first thing that I always you know, think is important to remind ourselves um, that being in nature, we're therefore connecting not with nature, but also ourselves with others. And we're learning about our environment and we are part of that environment. So I think when you are when in a time when we've been disconnected from each other, the need to be in nature is saying the, is, is the need to connect basically, is to feel part of a greater you know world which we're we're living on and i think it's about um really finding like you find solitude in nature you find peace in nature you find clarity it teaches you it challenges you i've always found that um when i've gone in walks or been in somewhere quite like wild it's taught me a lot about myself more than any project or work um that I've ever done. So I think, you know, it's a really about us trying to find greater purpose and meaning uh, to life and to remind ourselves that we are part of it. Um, and also that we have a responsibility to care for nature, like nature is abundance and will con continuously provide for us if we are caring and responsible and look after it and provide it with a space to grow and flourish. Um, and I think also, especially with food in cities, which is also a big thing, um, and the, how it's affected our food systems in the last year, there's a keen um, interest to grow locally, to make things more locally sourced. And that's why, you know, you're seeing more community gardens, people growing in their backyards and really understanding um, and learning where things come from and how um, how they're produced. And not only the like process of it, but the like the emotional like benefit it gives, the learning and the caring nature gives to us as well. It's a caring process. Um, I once listened to a podcast that said, you know, the earth cares, the soil cares for us. And it's true. Um, so it's important that we do the same back. And I think also as the designers, we, you know, and scientists, we can then use technology and innovation to enhance nature. And that's where like, there's a new level coming up um, onto that. And it's using nature and saying, okay, this is learning about it. how can we elevate it? How can we amplify it? How can we make it more efficient? Um, and, you know, to kind of respond to the challenges we face, both in the climate emergency, by um, um, diverse uh, diversity, um, deg degradation, etc. So, yeah, there's loads, <laughs> loads and loads of um, reasons why people have an interest in nature because we are, we are it. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks. I think, you know, yeah, so eloquently put, I think there, I think there has been a, a past in which, 
um, in urban centres, we have kind of taken to make, made conscious choices to take nature out of those areas uh, at mm -hmm. significant um, kind of negative impact in terms of people's well-being as well. And you, you mentioned there the kind of mental health side of stuff as well. And there's lots mm -hmm. of evidence now about the importance of green space, particularly in urban areas, as, as being supportive of people's well-being. So I think that's, that's some excellent thoughts. And Nasi, I'd like to, to hand over to you there for your thoughts on that, that, that particular question. Um, a lot of things that uh, Shays um, kind of mentioned uh, are very important, I guess, for everyone, like the well-being, uh, being around uh, vegetation, uh, being in, an, in healthy gardens in cities. Um, from from my perspective, um, it's important to, to allow the, the the green to take over, uh, especially in a city where, like London, where things are very uh, some, many times rigidly planned, uh, and in a way, buildings are um, trying to be as perfect as possible to accommodate people. But uh, I think what we're forgetting is the is is the nature itself, and and, and this idea of openness. Uh, and, and slowness even to, to look closer into an intricate uh, patch of grass or, um, and I, I think this slowing down of the pace really helps uh, people. And uh, yeah, my hope is that uh, cities and developers, urban planners really um, acknowledge that and they integrate that, uh, the idea of nature as part of architecture and not seeing them as two separate things that we've designed a public square and then we need to put a garden in the middle. I would say that buildings should uh, integrate uh, these concepts in, in the making of, uh, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I think with, uh, yeah, we've gone through that kind of period of having, er of, of, of some areas which were incredibly kind of stale if you like and not particularly uh welcoming and i think the incorporation of green space is really important also i mean from the kind of climate change side of stuff also the kind of the 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 kind of co-benefits if you like of integrating green space into into urban areas in terms of the benefits that they can provide in terms of helping to provide shading in the in the summer months to, to reduce the urban heat island effect and to provide cooling, uh, so, so, so shading and cooling in the summer months and also to, to uh, provide warmth in the, in the winter months as well. It's amazing what, what a difference those kind of tree species, for example, in urban areas can make in terms of both uh, mitigating in terms of reducing emissions, but also helping to adapt to a, to a warmer climate as well. And, and one which is more, more kind of, um, it, well, where there's more extremes of weather, where there's more um, heavy, intense rainfall events, for example. So Matthew, really interested in your thoughts on that, that same question um, as well, in terms of your kind of views about the way in which nature is incorporated into urban design. Um, I guess I would just like to add that it's kind of not just important, it, it has to happen now. It, it's, it's, it's essential. Um, and because the delicate balance of nature is responsible for everything, everything from, you know, our food, our climate, our air, everything that we need. Um, I think sometimes because we live on such a green island and uh, in one of the greenest cities in the world, we sometimes forget that, um, you know, a quarter of our mammals are endangered. Um, we only have 30 harvests left in our soils because of the lack of biology there. Um, and it's just, it's just, it has to happen now. You know, we, we have to do all the things that, that Shay and um, Messios are talking about straight away. Great. Thanks, Matt. And we'll go on to another question now. So I know that all of your designs either incorporate um, irresponsibly sourced um, materials or indeed materials um, that have been re repurposed. So um, just like you maybe starting off with Nasios, just to talk about um, uh, how you chose and why you chose the particular um, materials for your piece and perhaps kind of just to reflect, expand that to reflect more widely on the role that architects and designers can play in encouraging more sustainable building design and indeed retrofit as well. Yeah, um, a lot of uh, our research uh, with IRA kind of developed over uh, our studies at UCL and we looked into subtractive thinking and uh, taking uh, large chunks of material and how do we repurpose them. And I think this creative uh, reuse, uh, you can see it in 
cultures of the south, uh, and even of the vernacular in England, if you go outside London, you see how people uh, creatively reuse uh, different things to, and, and they basically uh, extend the lifespan of a product uh, or a building material. Um, so having said that, uh, the project itself, like um, the repurposed uh, wind turbine blade was just sitting there um, and it, it was going to probably uh, be sitting there for uh, some time um, without any use. And uh, one of the most powerful images from our research was the, this, this uh, graveyards of the wind turbine blades. So we essentially uh, get um, a large piece of infrastructural waste and, and we chop it and we give it uh, meaning and, and we offer it back to the city and the people hopefully um, will understand and interact with it in a, in a positive way. And I think, again, uh, um, the role of the designer is to see an opportunity in a, in a, in a problem or, in, in a, uh, or ask the big question. Uh, I, I, th I think it's very important. Um, obviously, there's, there has been a lot of talk of uh, uh, repurposing buildings, especially in London, where um, we're in a very kind of had situation with uh, space, but I, I think we could uh, also offer our knowledge or our creativity, I would say, to other disciplines and, and, and especially in the public realm. Great, many thanks, Nasios. And, and Matt, over to you to, to respond to that equivalent question. Um, yeah, just from what Nasia said, rebuild, reusing rather than rebuilding is such a really important one, I think. Um, it's super important. Uh, we chose the material we did, the ply, because it is a sustainable material and it did work for, for us in terms of uh, the budget and scale. Um, but there's many other materials out there that need to become standard. Um, we've been pushing uh, natural fibre composites a lot and trying to get our um, trying to get our clients and things to, to go out on a limb to use these um, because the problems that come up, especially in commercial, are um, regulations, standards, and, and warranties. Really, um, so uh, yeah, things like things like natural fiber composites, uh, using mycelium is a really interesting one. Um, we need to kind of really um, be creative and keep on being creative with these materials because there are so many options out there, and we need to we need them to replace many of the materials that we are using now, really, and fast. Right, thanks, Matt. And could, I guess not everyone here will be familiar with mycelium. Uh, so maybe if you could just kind of elaborate a bit more on, on that and its role. Okay, so the mycelium network is, is the network of kind of roots and things from uh, fungi. And um, they have all these amazing properties that you can grow into them, essentially. So you could have uh, made into bricks, then afterwards you could, you could have a brick that um, heats your house better. You could have a brick that was really, really strong, like steel. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what they are. Great, great, thanks. Um, and Shay, over to you for your response to that question. Um, yeah, sorry, just mycelium. Love mycelium, so love someone talking about mycelium. Also, mycelium is also able to like um, it helps with polluted soil as well. It's known to like clean up oil spills. Um, it has many amazing amazing uh, um, properties um i guess yeah i have a real interest in like regenerative like um um uh design and the idea of circular economy and reusing and thinking of the creative and like um ways of doing so um i think like we've said if it's not creative it's not attractive people just don't some just don't want to buy into it the truth is that a lot of people do have an interest in the environment and you know the climate emergency but there's also a lot of people who want to will engage because you know it affects their families and they don't actually have the means to be thinking about um the financial means or the you know the social means to be thinking about these um very big topics and we need to engage people in all the different parts of their life um, and think about ways they can um be part of the solution um for algae meadow um one of the things that we were looking at was the kind of construction. So thinking about like the embodied carbon um, process, which is obviously the amount of carbon you use when you're creating uh, a project. 
Um, and so that was looking at using kind of off the shelf timber, um, standard sizes, kind of minimizing how much of the fabrication was needed. And also the afterlife. So the idea is that, you know, it's just literally kind of very Ikea pack kind of vibe. You can scale this installation down. The hope is that, you know, a lot of these, these installations are going to go to community gardens or schools afterwards. So thinking about how it can be repurposed in a local school, which may not be able to house the whole thing, but maybe only a part of it was really important and something we considered from the beginning of the design. Um, and then we have obviously the um, kind of operational carbon, which is like the amount of carbon you use whilst it's running. So on site, we have a solar panel to um, fuel the hydroponic system to, for the pump that circulates the water around all the trays. We also got a handheld uh, a treadle pump or ha and a handheld pump to pump um, water through the algae um, tubing. So, you know, you know, mechanical power as well, thinking of the different types of power you can use on site. Um, and yeah, that was really important to make sure that it was kind of self-sufficient, off-grid, and uh, also celebrated the different energy sources that we can use um, that aren't um, carbon um, centered. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I think it was yeah interesting to talk about the embodied carbon. I think, um, I should know this off my head, I think it was maybe the, was the Royal College of, of Architects or the, whichever the key architectural umbrella organisation was, and there was a report which came out relatively recently emphasising the, the embodied carbon and how we um, yeah really need to make sure that we're not just knocking down buildings all the time and building new ones because yeah that's creating a whole extra bunch of carbon, albeit that you know, we may be able to build really efficiently. We need to be looking really at how we can repurpose materials and also the kind of retrofit side of stuff. Nassio, so you've got anything else you'd like to add to that, that last point? Yeah, uh, just about the afterlife, and I just wanted to uh, open it up to any local schools that might be interested to uh, get uh, one of our planters from the Windflower, please to get in touch with us. Oh, that's one. In here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's two of them done. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really nice uh, call to action there, Nassios. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, and uh, presumably they should contact you via your website if, they, uh, if they'd like to take you up on the offer. Yes. Yeah, perfect, great. And um, so we have a question come in from Vicky. Um, so she uh, asks, she has a kind of example of the, the Finnish sauna in terms of connecting uh, people to nature via cultural bathing. And she asks the question of how we can do this in London. And says many off-grid wood-fired experiences are emerging along the South Coast. Um, and it sounds as if it would provide a great outdoor winter experience as she, she mentions in her, in her message. So I guess, so that's quite a specific question, but so if anyone can comment on that, that, that would be great. But I suppose to extend that slightly, um, uh, any other examples you've got of um, ways in which you're incorporating uh, learning and experiences from other countries into your into your design? So who'd like to, to, to take take either the first point or the kind of wider point of, of learning from other, other countries? Um, well, first of all, very have a I have a big love for saunas. Um, so I'm glad someone, it's quite random. Um, a nice link here. Um, oh, my bad. Um, yeah, Finnish saunas, uh, bathing, um, I think not only as a typology, is an amazing way of not only connecting with our landscape, but also each other, like the kind of history of the bath, the bathing and the bath was used as like a public forum as the debate and discussion and a very big social centre for people to like um, talk and um, discuss like the comp like in the commons um, so I think yeah I think bringing it back is also a chance for like creating new like common like places where people can um, like share and ideas and um, um, connect um, I also think it's a very egalitarian environment or obviously when you strip back and you're in like very little um, underwear the idea of class and social class um, kind of disagree and disseminate um but in terms of like the uh, environmental benefits and how we can bring it back into london there are a few like you know saunas that aren't so like the idea of saunas have become quite a, like maybe elitist idea of like spas but i think it's also an important like cultural space um and it's actually not that hard to well, there are people who are building their own saunas and small saunas and ways of making it a bit more efficient. Um, I think um, looking at, you know, I think the biggest challenge is the heating process, especially in winter and thinking of how you kind of heat a sauna and how you kind of um, in an affordable way, whether that's, you know, green power. Um, and then in terms of looking at other countries, 
It's a challenging one because each country and climate is different. So it's not about just taking an idea from one place and popping it into another um, environment. But I think, you know, looking at different vernacular um, uh, architecture um, is really important. Um, I have, have a big love for um, Yasmin Lowry, who um, is the head of like Barefoot Architecture. Um, and she does, um, I remember going to a talk where she talked about um, mud earth buildings and how it can withstand earthquakes more than any concrete or steel building that has ever been done. The fact that, you know, vernacular um, architecture is, you know, primitive and not as effective is a myth. And it's also important to decolonize the ideas of a lot of the kind of ideas we have about architecture. So some of these very like long traditional forms of architecture are very, very, very helpful and beneficial into sol solving a lot of our climate um, challenges when it comes to the built environment. Um I think just to follow on from what Shelley was saying about um, how it's very much based upon your environment. And we have um, such amazing walks in the UK and um, I've done a lot of walking along the Icknell Way recently, uh, the chalk walks. And um, I think it's a culture that we have that we really need to continue with. And I think what's happened over the last couple of years has really um, put a big spike into that again, which I just think is amazing. Walking is so beneficial in so many different ways um, and it's for us as well as creatives um, walking is so important you get so many good ideas from going on a walk um, uh, yeah that's what I wanted to add really. great thanks Matt and that's just anything else to add no that the thing I mean say um, I agree with a lot of things uh, you mentioned and there's a great book uh, called Subnatures by David Gizen who talks about this idea of integrating uh, things that we don't find beautiful, or we, we, especially in cities where everything is so kind of uh, planned by the book and by the protocol. And I think it is very important to honor uh, the vernacular and uh, and, and honor the, the the tradition. Where I think we're at a, at a stage where. Um, the discussion is, is is global, but without a local idiom, the vernacular wisdom or materials that we can actually relate to as people, um, I, I don't see how it's, it will be sustainable uh, as the development of cities. Not sustainable in, in a way like um, greenwashing, as uh, Sheikh was mentioned before, but also like uh, as a society, as okay, the how do people actually live here? Uh, it's, it's very important. The other thing that uh, comes to mind was one of the swimming pools that was put up in King's Cross during the development, and uh, that was removed. It would have been nice if it uh, stayed as, as part of the project itself. And I, I think um, we, we should start convincing uh, people who, who work on these big developments that uh, these things are essential for social sustainability and for, for people who will live and inhabit uh, the spaces for 20, 30 years. Yeah, I also just want to say in terms of what um, Matthew said that like um, there's really importance for us to get like have the um, opportunity to go into our green spaces and there's currently like um, one of the um, laws that the government's trying to push through is like the um, against trespass, trespassing on private land um, and I think so it's really important that we're aware of the kind of the kind of implication that may have because a lot of the land that we think is public which we go on walks on is actually private and I think this kind of way that people may use it in future to target people um, on these um, public spaces through you know discrimination etc will mean that a lot of people will be um, criminally charged and and feel less encouraged to go into green spaces uh, so I think it's really important in terms of policy to be aware of how that's going to implicate you know people's right um, and privilege um, taking their privilege away to access these spaces which are really important for their mental health so yeah I think that's a really important thing in terms of like land rights and land justice. It's really important um, to be fighting against these kind of um, very oppressive um, laws that the government's trying to pass through. 
Okay, thanks for raising that, Shay. Um, so I'm, we're com coming close to the end of our hour. So um, I'll just come to each of you in turn just to ask you. So hopefully those of you who've been listening in have been in inspired to get down to South Kensington to see these fantastic installations. So um, maybe if we go from, from Matt today and then to Shay and then to Nasios, just to ask you to kind of reflect um, on what you, what in an ideal world, what you hope people will take from having seen and engaged with your um, your, your installations. Um, I for, for us, I, I hope that people will feel closer to nature. I hope people will learn more about pollinators and um, take that home with them, essentially. Um, we'll plant more pollinator-friendly plants. We'll, if they have a garden, make passageways between gardens for animals, make homes for birds and bats, um, you know, all these things. Um, and get, get behind initiatives like rewilding initiatives, like the one that's happening to try and reclaim our Thames floodplain would give us so many new habitats. Uh, just, yeah, go out there. Great. Thanks, Matt. Over to you, Shay. Um, I hope that uh, people feel inspired by the project to realise there's a lot on your doorstep, um, even just, you know, the soil underneath your feet, that the complexity of everything around us, there's so much to learn from everything around us, um, to be inspired to go outside, to... Um, to learn more about um, the environment, to experiment, to research. Um, I recently did a, a, created a learning resource for a new direction for teachers about biomimicry, trying to encourage young people in schools to really learn from the natural world and design using nature inspired design. Um, and I think stuff like that is really important to really start thinking about understanding nature Well, we might have lost Shay there, at least it lost at my end. So um, uh, hopefully we'll get Shay back in a sec. If we go over to, to Nasios for your for your comments. Um, I would say a flower, uh, but uh, uh, I would, I'm just thinking, uh, other than the inspiration of uh, kind of being in the space itself, um, I would really uh, like for people to understand the life span of, uh, of, the, of the project itself. And um, architecture, I think, and the built environment uh, should, uh, should be designed to last longer. And the conversations we're having today, hopefully they will be affecting things in 15, 20 years. Uh, so I think it's very important for people to understand that um, the way things weather, the way things change over time, the way we uh, reuse uh, creatively um, something that we haven't thought about before is very important. So hopefully someone else will uh, come up with a different or great idea of reusing a, a material or a, a product and uh, integrating it in, in the building environment. Great. Thanks, Nasios. And sorry, we lost you there for, for a minute, Shay. So if you'd still like to, to finish off your comments. Um, I don't know where I left off, but um, it was just basically saying just to inspire people to explore more and um, to be in nature and learn from it as much as possible, really. Fantastic. Thanks. And so, yeah, one of the we often get asked at the Grantham Institute of things, the things that we can do uh, about uh, nature and about climate change. And the number one thing we often say is to have your voice heard by those in power. So if you think there's something that's not quite right in your local area, like if there's not enough green space in your local area, then yeah. write to your local councillor, write to your local MP and encourage that change. I think it's really important. And we, all, as, you, as you've all touched on, kind of come to appreciate nature that much more over the last um, last year or so. Um, great. Well, unfortunately, that brings us to the end of the, this discussion. So thank you so much again to Matt, Shea and Nasios for joining us. For those of you watching live on YouTube, um, apologies if we, and it's, I think we covered all the questions, but um, apologies if we, we weren't able to cover everything that was there. Um, a recording of the discussion will appear soon on the Great Exhibition Road Festival YouTube channel, uh, so you can watch again or share with your friends or colleagues. Um, it's worth mentioning that all future live events are recorded, um, um, uh, are recorded from the festival, and they'll be appearing on the YouTube channel. So um, if you click the subscribe button or give us a follow, then you'll get a notification when a new uh, live event or recorded video, video gets posted. Um, and we'll have a link soon, which will get posted in the YouTube chat to an, an evaluation form. So you can tell us what you thought of the event. And we'd really appreciate your feedback. 
Um, and just as a heads up of something happening in a month and a half's time, the Great Exhibition Road Festival is returning to South Kensington and it's online from the 9th to the 15th of October. And it's looking at whether science and the arts can help inspire a greener future for the planet we share. So very much kind of building on some of the conversations we've been having uh, to, uh, today. So please do join us for a week of free events for all ages to celebrate our remarkable world and how we can keep it remarkable. Um, uh, and also obviously simultaneously tackling these kind of key issues around climate change and um, protecting our biodiversity and, and nature. And please do visit our website or follow us for latest news about the festival and links will be appearing in the chat. Otherwise, uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much uh, to all of the speakers. Thank you so much for all of you to give uh, some of your lunch hour to join us today. And I hope you have a fantastic afternoon. Bye. Bye.